Hello and welcome to our morning service at First Christian Forum Church of Montreal. Today we're celebrating Father's Day. During our service, we are going to be taking time to focus on the work that God does through fathers and also the other men that he puts in our lives. If you're joining us for the first time today, thank you for being with us. If you'd like to find out more about us at First CRC, you can check out our website. It's at www.montrealcrc.org. And you can also visit us on Facebook. As we begin our time of worship today, we have a couple of suggested songs to share with you, Good to Me, and How Deep the Father's Love for Us. If you look in the description of this video below, you'll find links to other YouTube videos that contain lyrics and music for each of these songs in case you'd like to listen or even sing along. Come, sing praises to God. Rejoice in His presence. For He is our God, a Father to the fatherless, and the defender of all who need protection. The one in whom the lonely find a home and the prisoner finds release. Bless the Lord, the God of our salvation. Who sustains and strengthens us day after day. Let's, Let's worship, worship God together. Our God himself greets us this morning with these words first written by the Apostle Paul. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. A Reflection for Father's Day, The Longing and the Love, written by Brian London for Worship at Austin Stone. We long for the perfect protection of a father, for strong arms that encircle us, hold us tight to a broad chest, a beating heart, arms that toss us into the air, screaming with laughter and a little fear, even though we know those arms will always catch us. From the moment we gasp our first breath of air, we long for the perfect father. We long for a father who sacrifices, who lays down his time to play games, read our favorite book one more time, or take a long walk and listen, who reaches into his pocket and pulls out a dollar for ice cream, who reaches deeper to provide a good home, good food, and good gifts. We long for a father who always protects, always cheers, and always sacrifices. Some of us are blessed to find bits and pieces of these longings met in human form, like sun through stained glass, a brilliant picture, illuminated by our father who satisfies these longings. We thank God for fathers who protect, who encourage with strong words and strong convictions, fathers willing to sacrifice, striving to love. But some of us are grieving, grieving the loss of a good father or the lack of one. Some never knew their father's arms and some bear scars on skin and soul, dealt from a father's swinging arms. At some point, all of us are left longing, lacking. No human father can perfectly satisfy. Look up and know your Father in Heaven gave you these longings, and only He can perfectly fulfill them. His strong arms protect. His words bring life and light. His perfect sacrifice draws us to His side, where we can hear His heart beating with perfect love for us. We celebrate our fathers on earth and our Father in Heaven we give thanks for the longing and we give thanks for the love. Our scripture reading for today comes from Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 23. Before we read these words together, let's come before God in prayer. Our Lord and our God, as we again hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Acts 10, starting at verse 1. 
At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send a man to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it was early on in our marriage that I learned an important lesson about hospitality. My wife Marilyn and I, we had just moved to a new town, but when we got there, we happened to meet a couple that we knew from when we'd lived in Ontario. Jim was a seminary student doing an internship at the church that we had started going to. Jess mostly stayed home. She was busy raising their two adorable little kids. They were very nice, very friendly couple, but it was pretty clear that they were still struggling with some things yet. One day in particular, Marilyn came home and told me that she had been visiting with Jess. Jim was getting home just as Marilyn was leaving. And as Jim was coming in the door, he informed Jess, Oh, and by the way, I invited the youth group over for supper. They'll be here in about 20 minutes. You might want to clean up the place a bit. The moral of this story, at least from the way that it was told to me, was pretty clear. Don't you ever ever try anything like that. Now, this particular story also illustrates another reason why we often avoid extending hospitality to others. It sometimes happens that we try to avoid having guests over because the house just isn't presentable. At least it doesn't look presentable to us. There's nothing in the fridge to serve. We don't have any time to get anything ready. But then, in her book, A Christian View of Hospitality, Michelle Hirschberger points out, too, that it isn't just those external things that sometimes keep us from inviting others in. It's not just that we don't have time to get the living room tidied up or to, to get the good silverware polished. 
often what keeps us from inviting others in is the fact that we also need to take care of things on the inside. Before we can welcome strangers into our lives, we need to deal with another stranger. We need to deal with the stranger on the inside. And in some ways, the story about the Apostle Peter that we just read from Acts chapter 10, that's a good example of how we sometimes have to deal with the stranger inside. As Hirschberger points out, God knew that Peter had a lot of internal work to do before he could invite in certain strangers who were headed straight for his door. Before he could properly welcome the messengers Cornelius had sent to fetch him, Peter had to deal with his own hesitations and reservations. Now, it might be a little hard for us to understand why Peter would have had any issue with going to see someone like Cornelius. Cornelius, as we're told, was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He was a career military man, an officer in the Roman army. We're also told that Cornelius and all his family were devout and God-fearing. So, even though he was a Gentile, not a Jew, Cornelius had devoted himself to God, to the God of Israel. Cornelius hadn't been willing to get circumcised, but he still prayed to God regularly. He gave generously to the poor. He probably attended worship services on the Sabbath. He may have even observed the laws about clean and unclean foods. And for someone like Peter, someone who had been with Jesus, the fact that a person like Cornelius would have been interested in the gospel, that should not have come as a surprise. Jesus himself had been willing to go out of his way to help a Roman centurion. And on that occasion, Jesus had said, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And later on, just before he ascended to heaven, Jesus had reaffirmed this idea that the good news would go out to all peoples. He had told Peter and his other disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Peter, he had seen for himself that Jesus meant them to take those words literally. Peter had been in Jerusalem on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit had come down and, and filled the apostles. He had been in Samaria too when the believers there had received the Holy Spirit. God had made it clear that there was to be no barrier between Jews and Samaritans anymore, not in his church. So why does God decide to give Peter this vision then? Because the vision is obviously from God. We're told that this, this thing, like a large sheet, comes down from heaven. When the voice tells Peter to kill and eat, there's no doubt in Peter's mind who it is. This is the Lord speaking. But then, why does Peter say no? Why does he have to see this vision three times before it finally starts to sink in? Part of the issue for Peter is that he had been raised with the idea that there were certain foods you simply, simply did not eat. Moses had said certain animals were unclean for Israel. You just didn't eat them. But this was about more than just food. This was about how Peter looked at himself. This was really a challenge to his own sense of identity. Peter was a Jew, an Israelite. And the Israelites, they had been set apart by God. But now, if there's now no distinction anymore between clean food and unclean, if there's no real difference anymore between Jew and Gentile, where does that leave someone like Peter? What does that make me? If being Jewish doesn't matter anymore, then, then what am I then? Now, I've mentioned it before that in the ancient world, people were often very selective about whom they had over as guests. People had this sense that you are, to some degree, identified by the company you keep. We sometimes say, you are what you eat. But back then they would have said, no, you are with whom you eat. 
And that's part of the reason why Jesus got so much flack for sitting down and eating with sinners and tax collectors. Because he was basically saying that he was one of them. And that's still true to some extent even today. I've never been invited to, say, the premier's house for a visit. I've never had lunch with a major league MVP. But then again, I don't move in those circles. That's not part of who I am. At the same time, there have been occasions when I've avoided other people, people who I don't know very well, people who don't seem to have much in common with me. And I managed to talk myself out of making contact with them by saying things to myself like, what have I got to say that'll mean anything to them? I've got enough trouble figuring out my own problems. What makes me think that I'd be able to help them tackle theirs? The real issue, though, according to Michelle Hirschberger, is that we can't be hospitable to the strangers out there until we get in touch with the stranger inside. We need to be at home with ourselves. And that means we need to put aside our pride, our pretenses. We can't really welcome anyone into our lives as long as we insist that everything has to be just so. That also means that we have to deal with the self-hatred and self-loathing that we so often feel. We get annoyed with ourselves because we're not just so. We don't think that we're good enough. But the truth is that it's okay when guests and strangers find out that we're less than perfect. It's okay if they find out that we come with baggage too. It's okay to be ourselves with other people. Think about it this way. God knows who we are. God already knows all about us, even the stuff we try to hide from everyone else. And yet, yet, he still loves us enough to send his own son to us, to give us new life through his death on the cross. With Peter, it takes some time for him to realize just what Jesus' death really means. The really big breakthrough, that will come a little later once he gets to Cornelius' house. Just as he's about finished telling Cornelius and his family and friends how everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name, just at that moment forgiveness will come to Cornelius and his household. The Spirit will be poured out in that room, even though it's packed full of Gentiles. It will come as a surprise to the Jewish believers who are with Peter, at least at first. But the spirit coming upon Cornelius, upon his friends and family, that will stand as proof that they too have received God's gift of forgiveness. And Peter himself will ask, so can anyone, anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? Can anyone say, no, these folks don't belong, even after they have clearly received the Holy Spirit? But even before any of that can happen, Peter needs to undergo a further change himself. He still needs to first come to terms with what it really means for himself to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He still needs to come to terms with what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter knows that he can't ignore the vision he's been given, not after seeing it three times. He knows that this vision is from God, and he has some idea what it probably means. And Peter knows that he can't ignore the strangers standing at the gate either. He's learned by now that things like this don't just happen by accident. But what does it for Peter? What finally forces him to come around is the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself says to Peter, Simon, those men, those three men are looking for you. So you need to get up and head back downstairs. Don't hesitate about going with them. Yes, I know it'll be hard for you. They aren't Jews. And yes, other people will talk. But it's okay. I have sent them. So Peter heads back downstairs. He joins Simon the Tanner, his host, at the gate. He asks Simon, are you okay with inviting these three gentlemen in? Is that all right? Good, wonderful. Then come on in. Dinner's ready. 
let's eat. And so the five of them, two Jews, three Romans, they sit down together to share a meal. It's probably still a little awkward for Peter having to ask a Roman soldier to pass him a pita. It's probably weird for Peter's guests, too. They've probably never shared a meal with Jewish people before. But around that little table, we see Jesus at work once again, once again, changing the world. And when you think about it, in a sense, we're at that little table, too. Most of us here, from what I know at least, we don't have any Jewish ancestry. And that means that most of us here, we would be considered Gentiles too. But because of what started around that little table, we are also counted as God's people. What happened around that table was part of the process God used to bring us into his covenant family too. And what happened to Peter, that sort of thing still happens Take, for example, this story of what happened to one member of an inner city church. It's a simple story, really. Nothing true dramatic. It is no secret that the south central part of our city is known as a tough neighborhood. I never had a bad experience there, but over the years, I got in the habit of driving around that area. Another part of my story is Tuesday night basketball. I love to play basketball, even though I'm not 20-something anymore. I look forward to regular recreation with my friends. After we finished the new gym at church, there were just a few of us who came to play, but then the floodgates opened. There were a couple of guys from the church and lots from the neighborhood and across the city. 85% of the guys were African-American, and I'm Caucasian, and they had a different way of doing things. All of a sudden, instead of coming to a relaxing night of basketball, I was in charge organizing the play. Somebody had to. There were over 35 men there. I started to dread coming. So many guys I didn't know, and everything was so different. They had their own system for choosing teams. Their style of play was different, but pretty high level. I was also not prepared for the disagreements and yelling that happened at the games. I grew up believing that yelling meant fighting, but here it didn't. Whatever the problem, it got settled somehow, and we continued playing. As the evenings went on, I played on a number of teams, and a real camaraderie developed. I found myself in the middle of a lot of bantering and talking on the sidelines. Some of the guys came every time. We were glad to see each other. Many of us became friends over the winter, being in the minority, I began relating to people I had not related to much before. One day, I stopped to pick up my mentee, Elliot. He wasn't home. I went to the neighbors who said her son was at the neighborhood basketball courts and would know where Elliot was. When I got to the courts, her son recognized me. He ran to the fence and agreed to guide me to where Elliot was. As we drove down the street talking and laughing, I realized I was also looking to see if any of my gym friends were playing basketball or walking on the sidewalks. Suddenly it hit me. I wasn't scared anymore. Before I watched for these same young adults watching to make sure they weren't following me or trying to mug me, now I'm trying to find my friends. I'm telling you, I will never drive down those streets the same. I will never be the same. God still has this way of intervening in our lives. Maybe not always by giving us visions, but he has this way of opening our eyes so that we see who we really are. And in the process of helping us to see who we really are, who we really are in Christ, in the process of helping us to get to know the stranger within God also then opens us up so that we can invite others into our lives. Amen. As we continue our worship together, let's spend a few moments in silent reflection. We have a few questions to help guide your thoughts. Why is it difficult sometimes to include new people in our lives? 
How often is it that the problem is with us, not them? How does knowing that God loves us even though we're not perfect encourage us to invite others into our lives? Let's again come to God in a time of prayer. The words that we'll be using as we pray were adapted by Rob McCoy from the United Methodist Book of Worship. For fathers everywhere who have given us life and love, that we may show them respect and love. Holy, Holy God, God, hear this prayer for our fathers. fathers. For fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope, and their family and friends support and console them. Holy God, hear this prayer for our fathers that mourn. For men, though without children of their own, acted like fathers and have nurtured and cared for us. Holy God, hear this prayer for our father figures. For stepfathers who have assumed that role with love and joy, who have loved the children of another as their own and created a new family. Holy, Holy God, God, hear this prayer for stepfathers. For adoptive fathers who have claimed the orphan and loved the once unwanted as a precious gift from God. Holy, Holy God, God, hear this prayer for adoptive, adoptive fathers. fathers. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength who have not responded to the needs of their children and have not sustained their families. Holy God, God have, have mercy, mercy on absentee, absentee fathers. For fathers who struggle with temptation, violence, or addiction, for those who do harm and for those whom they have harmed. Holy, Holy God, God, have, have mercy, mercy on fathers that struggle. struggle. For new fathers full of hope, for long-time fathers full of wisdom, for the fathers yet to be and fathers soon to be, Holy, Holy God, God, hear our prayer for, for the fathers of your church. For those that have shaped our lives without claim of family or kinship, for those who have taught us, guided us, shaped us, and molded us into servants of Christ our Lord, Holy, Holy God, God, hear our prayer for the fathers of our faith. faith. God our Father, in your wisdom and love you made all things. Bless these men that they may be strengthened as Christian fathers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. Grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Giving is part of our worship. It's part of how we show the love of God by reaching out to other people. Now, if you are just joining us online, there's no expectation that you have to give anything. But if you are part of the church family at First CRC, this is a way that we can give thanks to God and help in the work of His church. Our offerings this week are for our own ministries here at First CRC and for the Indigenous Ministry Office of the Christian Reformed Church, which includes a national committee, three urban indigenous ministries located in Edmonton, Regina, and Winnipeg, and a justice and reconciliation mobilizer. For more information on how to give, especially if you want to give online, you can contact us by going to our church website or our Facebook page. The God who has come into our lives also calls us to share in his work in the world around us. The blessing of God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and of Christ who summons us to service, and of the Holy Spirit who inspires generosity and love, be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. As we finish our time of worship together, we have a couple of more suggested songs to share with you. Good, good Father, and before the throne of God above, 
Again, if you look in the description below this video, you'll find links to other YouTube videos that include words and music for each of these songs. Until next time, God bless.